Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 9th of February. It is a Thursday here in 2023, and I got a big interview coming up for you. A guy in this industry has been in here for three decades. I've known him for over a decade. Uh, we don't always agree, but we're actually on the same page right now, heading into 2023. Paul Schatz, the founder of Heritage Capital, is going to join us today. And we're going to talk about anything and everything in the market, why he turned bullish on Bitcoin for the first time ever, coming up right now on Making Money. One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to www.americawarning2023.com. Get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it would dramatically affect you and your money. So again, go to americawarning2023.com for this free report. And here's the man himself right now joining us. First time I'm making money. Paul Schatz, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, I was trying to explain to the producer the first time, you know, we have a bit of rapport. We used to sit next to each other on a Fox, what, 10 years ago, maybe longer? I mean, it, it seems like yesterday, but it was, it was quite a bit, bit ago. Um, and I got to tell you, I don't know if we, if we agreed that much, Paul. I think we probably disagreed more than we agreed at the time, don't you think? We probably did. But, you know, my closest friends in the industry, I always say we're in trouble when we both agree. So True. I'm sure we didn't. But I remember sitting next to you, first of all, and I said, who does that guy think he's with those crazy socks? That was the first, <laughs> my first impression. And then yeah. you, start, you start talking about the peg ratio when valuing tech stocks. And I remember going home and going, what's the peg ratio? <laughs> Especially tech stocks, right? Because most of them don't have any earnings or you know, been back then. Um, yep. well, so good. So good to have you on. We've been wanting you get on for a while. I'm, I'm glad you took some time to jump in here. Um, and speaking about being on the same page, I think we both might be on the same page here looking at 2023. I know, uh, I think it was what, about middle of October, you turned bullish, I believe, kind of right near the bottom of the market. Um, you know, obviously, me being growth and innovation, I invest outside of that, but it was a rough year for that type of investing last year, as most of us know, and I've been open with. Uh, but, you know, this year, it's, it's turned around quite a bit. What is your view and what kind of made you switch, Paul, to becoming extremely bullish heading into 2023? So to be fair and transparent, so um, it's I, I was I came into 2022, and I always label my forecast some you know kind of stupid catchy title. So for 2022, I thought it'd be the year of frustration, patience, and quality. That's why I came in thinking that we weren't going to continue what we had in 2020 and 2021. I am always the first to admit I did not get the magnitude right for 2022. I did not see that large of a decline at all. I just thought it was going to be a really tough year to make money. So periodically throughout the year, you know how we do, we, we plant our seeds and then we prune and we plant, we prune. And you know, I had, there was a couple of weeks in 2022 where the market gods threw an anvil over my head. And there were a couple of weeks where they you know, gave me the, the magic wand and made me look really smart. But as the year went on, and we saw less and less downside uh, as the market went lower. So that's always a sign that momentum is waning and mm -hmm. you're always on guard for reversal. And then that, you know, into that, I, I'd all year long, frankly, I'd look for this cleanup coming in, uh, in October because it's a midterm election year. And in most yeah. midterm election years, when you have declines, they bottom in Q4. I mean, that, that's, and there's no science behind it really. 
Although someone could say that really it's politically motivated. But I came in, I was looking for an October low. That October 13th date was so crazy. I remember sitting here and the chain in my chair was so crazy. I remember the next day I walked in, I said, you know, either the bear market ended or we just put in a major bottom. So that, and, and also with the low being so close, it gave me something to shoot against if I was wrong. Yeah, so you'd limit downside. You, you obviously have stop losses and stuff. It went against you, you could get out. I mean, and it's come down to so much at that point. Um, so we obviously had, had a big rally since then, a great rally start 2023. Um, the S&P broke the downtrend line. A lot of good things happening technically. Are you still bullish, even though we've had such a big rally in the first five or six weeks of the year? You know, as I was coming into the office just now, I was talking to an industry friend of mine on the phone and we were, we were kind of reviewing the exact same thing. And I said, you know, in October, I said, God, I'm so bullish now. I think we ripped at least 30% from here. But when I looked at all the big stocks, none of them looked like they were bottoming. They looked like mm -hmm. they just found a point in the middle of nowhere. Well, little did I know it was going to take really that December decline that retested or put in secondary lows. So am I still bullish today? Yeah, because one, I haven't heard anybody really throw the towel in and say, you know, we, we know it at the bottom in, in October, I, and I've got my trading notebook sitting next to me, right? It's got every day commentary from certain people and certain amazing contrarians who when they're positive or going up, we're going down. Yeah, I haven't seen any of the wrong people throwing the towel and become bullish. I haven't seen it really in in retail. I mean, I, I said I was you know coming into the year. I said there's no one more bullish than I am, and I don't feel like people are embracing. They're still disavowing. They're still hating the rally. They're, they still think that you know recession is we're in the middle of it, and then the first quarter and first half are going to be awful. So, yeah, I'm still. Uh, you know, pedal the metal, risk on stocks, bonds, gold, crypto. And, uh, yeah. and, and until the market proves me otherwise, that's where I'm going to stay. So what is your typical like holding period? Does it vary? I mean, are you, do you kind of just take the, the trend where you're given right now? Do you look out several years? What, what is your average holding period here for your investments? So we run, uh, you know, shameless plug, sorry. We run 18 different portfolios and they're all quantitatively based. And each one has its own. So we have some strategies that will hold for a day or two or three. And that's okay. That's what the modus operandi is. And we've got other ones where we position for months and quarters and frankly, in, you know, into, into the year time frame. So I really, I, I try not to get hung up on a holding period. So like I bought Meta poorly. I bought Meta, I, no, if I find calling it Meta, I bought it above 300 and, and I did a poor job buying it, which I recognize. I held it, really bad move. Thankfully, it was only half a position, but I didn't add to it. And I just kind of traded around it on the way down, um, but I did a poor job. That was gonna be, a, that was gonna be a core holding, then it was a short-term holding or vice versa. So it's easy to go into a position with what you think's gonna happen, but, until someone punches you in the mouth, you really don't know. But I always try to have a plan before I own something. So do you see, um, you mentioned Meta, obviously, Facebook Meta, the big names. Are you more attracted to these big names, the, the, the large, uh, gigantic companies out there? Or are you kind of look for a little bit more opportunity in maybe the smaller large caps, mid caps range? I think it's both and depending upon the environment. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. If, if you and I both got together on October 13th and we said, this is the bottom, we're gonna rip from here. Well, you know that the first leg off a bottom, it's not sometimes, it's not occasionally, it's almost always the most beaten down, the most shorted, the most garbage runs the hardest and the hottest first leg higher. So those big, you know, fang plus the rest of the other, you know, dozen stocks, it's hard to really say you're so bullish and you want, and you see this bounce coming. Those stocks by just by kind of definition have to go. 
And yeah. I think we're in that phase right now where markets have bounced beautifully off that October 13th low and that, and they get it again, they bounced off of the December lows. And now I think we're fighting for uh, new leadership. So I'm not going to hang my hat on. I always tell people, you don't need to hire me to buy you, you know, Apple, Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA. Yep. So you could do it on your own. Don't pay anybody to do that. That's what you really want to own. Like you don't need to pay me to buy you a spy, right? I would say I always liked you on a show because you wouldn't come in with, oh, buy Apple. And, you know, I like to bash the financial media and not saying anything in particular so I don't get in trouble. But, you know, there's certain channels out there that it's you, you bring on somebody who manages billions of dollars, supposed to be one of the smartest people on Wall Street, and they say buy Apple. I mean, come on, like you no other better idea than that. Right. And again, like, what are you paying? For? Just go buy the S&P 500. If that's what you want to do, buy the spies and be done with it, right? You don't need us to help and, you with And that. frankly, for some people, I'm not ashamed, embarrassed. Some people, when they come into my office and they say, I say, what's your goal? We talk about blah, blah, blah. And then meeting number two or three, they say, I just want to you know, be the S&P 500. I said, then go buy the SPY or the IVV and call it a day. Yeah. You could buy that Fidelity equivalent with no management fee. Yeah. So, of course, most people are going to own some stake in Apple in their portfolio. I mean, it's a great long term. You can't argue with that, right? Yeah. It's a great yeah. long term holding. But I like to add value by the stuff that people go, what'd you buy? What mm -hmm. price did you buy it at? Why'd you do that? I mean... And, and that's, you have to get out of the mega caps because we know, you know, Wall Street is overly saturated with research on the mega caps. There's no, mm -hmm. no analyst can really, I shouldn't say no analyst, the vast majority can't add value on a name like Microsoft or Google. Yeah. But when you get outside of that zone, which we used to be out of all the time, that's where, you, you know, you, you get into the mids and smalls and you find some either diamonds in the rough or what I call unloved gems, you can at least, you know, put your stake in the ground, have your convictions, and then see where it ends up. Yeah, I think like you said there's, there's a place in portfolio for both, Paul. You know, the big names too. Like, I mean, the hot thing this week has been, you know, uh, artificial intelligence. A lot of those stocks are moving right now. Obviously, Baidu came out this week and that stock popped this week on news that they're launching their version of like basically chat GBT. You got Microsoft investing more money in open AI. You got Google saying they're going to come out with Bard, you know, and their, their version of it. Um, tough to find some pure play AIs, but do you view that technology as opportunities, you know, in the next five years? I know you're not looking out to the own for five years, but do you see some of these innovation and, and technology that was really pushed aside last year? You know, it was, it was taboo to own any technology innovation last year. But like I like to say, innovation doesn't sleep. I don't give a shit if it's a bear market or recession. Innovation is still taking place behind the scenes. You may not hear about it on the financial media, but it's taking place. And so the short answer to your question is yes. But let's remember, it, it was it's what, three years ago right now where we were a month away from being locked down. Think of all those companies that were started in garages from March of 2020 till March of 2021. They don't just, you know, hang a shingle and become Microsoft. They become, they, they get friends and family money and then they get angel and venture and, and so on and so forth. So of course, what we're hearing about what's the, you know, the theme of the week in the financial media is investable. But you know, for me, I, I liken it a lot to crypto. And as I called crypto, you and I have had nice exchanges about yeah. gold versus crypto, et cetera. Um, I, for the first time I, and since crypto has been around, I turned bullish on it in, in Q4, all right? And I, because for me, Matt, I did the same thing with dot com, and I, same thing in the '90s. I've been out there since night when I came in 1988. I'm terrible, a terrible investor when those companies come out of the gate. I mm -hmm. so I suck at it. Um, dot com, I didn't do it for clients. I lost clients over. I bought one stock for myself. I forgot the globe dot com. It went to zero. That was yes. my whole experience <laughs> with dot com. But I like after that whole thing blows up, which they always do, after you the tide goes out and you see FTX swimming naked and everybody else around swimming naked, that's when I get interested because I think all the froth and all the 
really the weak handed holders are long out of the stock sector instrument. So that's why I really started loving crypto and especially Bitcoin in mm -hmm. Q4. And, you know, and you spoke, I brought you to a conference twice. You know, people yep. still talk about Matt McCall and, and, the, <laughs> and your you know, crypto presentation. No, no BS. It was the best one I ever heard. It took, and I still didn't adopt it until just recently. <laughs> like, God, the crap of garbage, the, the fraud is largely gone. You're, they're going to regulate it. I hope it's SEC. Yep. And you're going to turn it into a real, I can't say reliable. You can turn it into a security that you can put it in a portfolio and not worry that it could be gone tomorrow. Yeah, it'd be a real asset class that people just like gold is an asset class. Certain people want to have a portion of it. I think I think crypto, you'll see the same thing. So do you are you seeing more and more clients, even after the rough year that crypto had still asking about crypto and gaining exposure to it? No. Um, interestingly, I've got a handful of clients who have always spoken about it. We have, we have we have great conversations about it. Respectful, good, back and forth, pros and cons. You know, I always like for, for me, poke holes in my thesis. I'm so mm -hmm. bullish, but tell me why I'm wrong. That's how you become a better investor. So I haven't, but I think a lot of clients have said to me, Paul, when you think it's right, then let's do it. Versus, because I don't I mean to be kind of candid, while my clients and I are partners in their portfolio. Only one person really can, you know, you know, what I mean? one guy's got to pull, one woman's got to pull the trigger. You, you can't have a conversation about the merits of a, of an investment. I need to have my convictions and pull the trigger. But I, a lot of clients have said, when you're, when you think it's right, count me in. Yep. Uh, that's, that's good to hear. And it's actually, I like the fact that your clients aren't as bullish on it. I, I hate to say that, but taking a contrarian view, you know, this is the time where, where I feel that that is probably, you know, I think we bottomed in, in Bitcoin. I, I think we did hit a bottom. I'm not saying we go straight up by any means, but I think we did hit a bottom. And and a company like Coinbase, I've talked about, I have no exposure to it in any way. But I, I got to tell you, if, if I'm right and Bitcoin is a true asset class over the years, Coinbase will be the one that comes out on top because they are already regulated and there's going to be more regulation. Um, and that's what people want. That's what big money wants. They feel more comfortable going into that than something else that's not regulated, which makes 100 percent sense to me. Um, and we own uh, for full disclosure, we own um, Coinbase. OK, I own it. And, and for a full disclosure, I bought it higher, too. I, I don't remember the number, but it's not yeah. relevant yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I bought it higher. I did add to it. I do like it. Um, you know, I remember when um, when I was writing my my 2023 forecast. I looked at Bitcoin. I said, you know, I think the downside maybe is 14, 14, 5. I think the upside is 30,000. Mm -hmm. I, if I could find five of those trades in my life for over a given year, yeah, I, I think I'd be a pretty good investor. And, I, and <laughs> You'd be I even better years. than you are. Yeah. So, so now that we're on crypto, we have to shift over to gold. I know you and I have had back and forth with gold over the years. Uh, you are bullish on gold here. Uh, what is the thesis for that? I flipped the coin. I used my Ouija board. It said go. <laughs> so it's a couple things. One, um, I thought the bear market uh, was ending last year. I, th I think when you look at, and it's not a ton of information on you know gold and crypto. It's not like a company where you can do all this in-depth homework and mm -hmm. get an edge over somebody else. So you have to have some kind of macro thesis and believe in the instrument. I mean, we run two gold strategies. I'm not a gold bug, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm negative on gold way more often than I am positive on gold. <laughs> but to me, the, there's a couple of driving factors. One, um, while I didn't think the Fed would cut rates in 2023, I do think the Fed's going to neutral. Mm -hmm. and, and neutral is enough on gold to get the asset class moving. That's number one. Um, number two, I thought that you know Europe and the UK remain that bug in search of a windshield. Th those Europe and, and UK, those currencies are just not sustainable long term. So if they're not sustainable, you have the dollar, which had an amazing run through you know for nine months of last year. And people aren't going to trust the Chinese currency. Let's be realistic. Yep. The yen, I think, you know, is, is beyond crazy volatile for a currency. 
So I think, and gold doesn't take a ton of buying to really move that asset class. So between Europe and the Fed, I think the, the backdrop is pretty good. I thought gold would go uh, above 2000. Now I'm thinking maybe I'm too conservative, maybe it could go to 2500. But gold isn't oscillating like a currency. It doesn't move like, you know, Apple long term. So when you get these great moves, they're often great selling opportunities, not times to pile on the momentum. So let me ask you this. You talk about the, the foreign currencies outside the U.S. And you can look at a chart of gold and look at a chart of the U.S. dollar index. U.S. dollar index topped around September, October, about the same time gold bottomed. You know, a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, inverse relationship. So if you think that that the foreign currencies won't do as well, does that then lead to the greenback doing well, potentially keeping a lid on gold? It's a so we know that long term dollar goes up, gold, oil and other commodities go down because they're obviously pricing dollars. Mm -hmm. But that's long term. And last year we saw the dollar soar and oil soar at the same time. Yep. So, you know, I always chuckle when I hear some of the commentators, some that are paid and some that pretend to be paid. They say, you know, uh, well, the dollar and oil can't go up together. So choose one. Nonsense. Certainly. Can't. It's like yeah. when they say the dollar and stocks can't both go up together. Really? Well, go look at the 1980s, the great bull market of the 80s, when the dollar soared and stocks soared. I think you could have a period where the dollar is tame. It doesn't it may not have a big trending move. It could go back to at some kind of period of digestion. And you get gold that just takes off and has a really phenomenal year. I, I, I always tell people, be careful when someone says something has to happen or always happens. What areas are you looking at now that get that have you excited for this year, Paul? So. I would say. Coming into 2023, in 33 years, I've never been more excited than coming into this year. And I, I'm, I'm not, you know me, wow. I, I don't BS. I real, I came in like this little kid in the candy store. I mean, I don't want to say that on December 31st, I was so pessimistic in Jan 1. I'm like, yes, this is great. Yeah. But starting in, you know, kind of Q4, I said, geez, well, I, I, I love semis. So that's okay. So that's obviously risk on. I love this thing called Bitcoin, which I've never loved in my life. I love gold. I'm really excited about that. Uh, in 2023, we took a position, which is now a decent size position in FDN, which is an internet ETF. Mm -hmm. um, I own uh, biotech is my, I think it's my biggest sector position. So you talked about innovation earlier. I bought biotech. We were a little early last year. Um, I added to it because I had really high conviction. So I added to it opportunistically into those plunges. I think biotech could be maybe the best sector, but certainly uh, up on top this year. I think there's so many great opportunities. You know, as I tilt my head and look at my other screen at some of the stocks that we bought um, in, in Q4, um, I, I was really focusing on Q3 and 4 stocks with big insider buying surges because the you know we I thought the economy was going to weaken, so I figured if you get a stock that's been decimated and the and the and the, the the top management of the company is buying, knowing the economy is going, so we bought yeah you know Rocket Mortgage. I waited all year to buy Rocket Mortgage till. Q4, they, they, their insiders bought it the whole second half of last year. Um, six flags. I was a head scratcher. How are these insiders buying the stock if we're going to have this big, bad recession? Because six flags would get pummeled in recession. It's not easy to beat the S&P 500, and especially as the cap weighting has become more dominant with, obviously, technology. Yep. But to me, if, you're, if the client says, hey, Matt, Paul, uh, just, I really want the S&P's returns. Buy the S&P, call it a day. If your client is a little more thoughtful and says, I don't care about the S&P over any given calendar year, but I want you to add value, now that gives you a little bit of a runway because yeah. frankly, we're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes every day, week, month, quarter, year. 33 yeah. years, always make mistakes. You learn yeah. from them and you move forward and do, every year I come in and 
I tell people my number one goal this year is to be better. I just want to be yeah. better than, I, than I've been. So being a stra- if I want to come back, boy, to be a, a buy side strategist or a sell side <laughs> strategist, I mean, write some reports, smile on TV, get paid for being wrong. Um, that sounds pretty easy. I always thought to come back as an economist because you basically, I think, get paid more being wrong as an economist, especially if you get hired by the government. Like, you just make shit up from day to day. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm sure you've seen that study that literally goes back hundreds of years, oh, right? Have you seen that? And, and they, they basically say no economist has ever really called recession, a true recession ahead of time. Never. That is insanity. I find, so I have an economics, I have a minor in economics, but I always find that side to be boring. Like I couldn't do that. It is boring, yeah. Day. I find the market side to, I mean, every day you come in, there's opportunities. Every day there's something hitting you out of left field. Things yeah. are going well, things are going poorly. But I find that much more exciting and you know invigorating than parsing through those, those economics reports. But you're right. And look, it's not easy. It's it's not easy to run money. That's how we get paid as well as we do. You know that, yeah. right? Yeah. And I love good years where you get paid over and over. You don't have to work as hard and you get pats in the back. In challenging years, you make less money, work harder, and people think you're in your, you, universally you're an idiot. Yeah. So it's not easy. Um, but you got to stick your neck out. You you know, plant your stakes in the ground. But that's why I, I and people get mad at me because I get, I, I was going to say borderline obnoxious, but I'm full on obnoxious about it. It's that <laughs> people who manage money are the ones who I want to hear from. I want to listen to those interviews of someone who's running uh, however many dollars and is risking capital on a daily basis. Someone who's, who's working at a wirehouse, who's pushed to be bullish, who's pushed to you know, pump out reports. I mean, I don't have a lot of respect for that person. No, I agree. And I, I, you know, I don't watch the financial news as much anymore. Uh, but when I do and you see some of these um, paid anchors, if you will, that are giving advice that have never managed money in their life, they've maybe written a few articles for Barron's here and there, but they've literally they're, they're borderline academics if you even want to give them that. But they've never actually put money on the line. It's basically paper trading in their head. That's a big freaking difference when you have not only your money, Paul, but other people's money. No, behind. that's the your money. I never, I shouldn't say never. I hardly yeah. ever look at what I have invested. Yeah, it's investing the same stuff my clients are invested in. But when you're talking about other people's livelihood and retirement, so it's as easy as it is to say, I never worry about it. But your clients entrust us with their future. So yeah. when I buy something and it immediately goes against me, I don't walk home and say to my wife, ha, 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 look what happened. And that is, there's a there's a psychological factor in investing, no matter how hard. That's why I we've built quant models, which takes, for us, it takes emotion out. I know personally, I'm a crummy emotional investor. I learned mm-hmm. that early in my career. I probably still am, although now we I rely on our models because it's it's... It's not an easy thing to do. I'm sure some people do it effectively. God bless them, and, and they deserve that success. But I, it is running money is not easy. And people say, you know, you get paid too much. S- you know, sit in our seat for a while and see what yeah. it's like when the markets are unraveling. And 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 even if your exposure is cut, and you're like, yeah, I still feel like I'm I have too much exposure. Oh, or when the market rips out of a bear market low, and you're like, I can't get long enough quickly enough. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're never going to be good enough for some clients. I, I've learned that the hard way. Um, not unfortunately, but situation that I'm in, I'm not managing people's money anymore. So I've had, it was 2022 was a nice year. My first year not managing money in 17 years. I got to tell you, I picked a pretty good gosh darn year to not manage money in 2022. Especially with my hair's going back too. I, I know. It's like dark. Somebody asked me the other day if I dyed my hair. I said, no, it's just, it's just, it's just the less stress is what's going on. But Paul, yeah, before I let you go, I we love it. Go ahead, sorry. We, that's what we I, do. Oh, I still love it. And I'll probably do it again at some point in my life. I, I probably will. So before I let you go, I ask every guest uh, I call the island question. So if I were to send you, your family, friends to whatever island of your choice for 10 years, can't look at your portfolio, but you can buy one asset class, one stock, one trend, whatever. What's the one investment that you just love right now you put away for 10 years? I did not prepare at all for that question, my <laughs> friend, but I like it, though. Thank you. I mean, clearly, I you, you don't have to be a genius to say you would 
you would invest in the in the stock market. That's that's not a hard I mean, that that's a cop out. Um, but I would say um, I'm giving it two ways. One, I'm I'm going to say Bitcoin is one of them. Okay. Because I think over ten years it's going to be some stupid number like a hundred thousand. Um, but that's not for everybody, and people should yeah. take that in in small doses. But I think in the in the U.S. markets, if you if you feet to the fire, have to own a stock for the next ten years, um, it's probably going to be some software stock like Atlassian. Because mm -hmm. I think they got it right. They they had bad earnings last week. That and Tesla would be, yeah. you know, obviously different industries. But I think they're gonna because you always want the next best in breed. Yes, and yes. I think it last seen with their, you know, smaller subscription prices. They're gonna appeal to the masses. They're gonna write their ship, and they're gonna return shareholders in stupid amount of money. And and you know, last seen the symbols team for every other TAM. Uh, that stock's been hit. I mean, that stock was nearly five hundred dollars. You know, it's down to one seventy-seven, but it's down about one fifteen not too long ago. So this, right. it's come down, and and I agree with you. I mean, that's that's the kind of company that you know. I looked at a lot of these companies like that, Paul, that came down, and like I don't know where that bottom was. I didn't know it was going to bottom at ninety or one ninety. You didn't know at some point, but if you believe in the future of this innovation and what they're doing, they're going to be successful. I mean, that company is going to be around. I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. Yes. But how long can a stock like this go sideways before the next leg up? I don't know that. And you have to be patient, I think, with a company like that. Agreed. And so I, someone asked me for one of these stocks in an interview. And I said, you know, at last year, I, they asked me at the end of last year. I did. I said, I didn't buy it yet. It's the t number one on my, I can't twitter my screen. It's yeah. the number one stock on my watch list. It's been there for over a year without me buying it. It's when I look at every single day, I want to see the volatility compress, mm -hmm. let it go sideways, ring out what's left of those you know, day traders or short term traders. Yep. The long term fundamentals are phenomenal. It traded some stupid valuation like what happened to, you know, a year ago. But yep. I think this one's going to be one of those, you know, I would say the Ron Barron stocks because he's done just you know, stupidly well with companies and holding them forever and having, you know, 10 X returns. Yeah. And, and you look at a company and it's making good money and it's, it's, it's on its way. So I, I appreciate you coming with a stock that somebody hasn't heard before. I mean, I've heard Bitcoin a lot. I've heard a lot of other things, but this is actually a really, a really good one outside the box. But um, your website is invest for tomorrow. Correct. That's go right. check them out. And if you need a money manager, go to Paul. I mean, I'd say that <laughs> because I've known Paul for a very long time and uh, such high regards I have for you and, and what you do. And I will say that the one thing I love about you, Paul, is you're a no bullshit guy. You know, Thanks especially in the industry, it's tough to find people like that. And I think that's why uh, we've stayed connected for over a decade because there's no bullshit in this room. We'll bust each other's balls a lot, but there's no, that's okay. there's no, that's yeah, the idea. yeah. But at least we know we're, we're, we're speaking real and we're not trying to push anything uh, that we don't believe in, you know, and both being historians uh, of the market and, and students of the market really today. To every day we wake up. Always a student because we're always learning. Yeah. Well, the best industry in the world. As much as it can be a pain yep. in the butt sometimes, yeah. it's the best industry in the world. But, Paul, thank you so much for coming on. We'll have you back on soon. But uh, for once, we're, we, thanks, we agree. So look out, world. Paul Schatz and Matt McCall we'll agree. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. Have a good one, buddy. All right. See you, Matt. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.